So what I'm going to do here is read through American Antiquities a little bit and show you how well known Champollion was and that there was plenty of reason for Joseph Smith to have known about him. This is a very well publicized book about the Gulf of Mexico. Kentucky itself, where we think, we have found remains of an Egyptian colony or nation, as in the case of the works and catacomb at Lexington, as in latitude but five degrees north of Egypt, so that whether we have visited America on a voyage of exploration or have been driven on the coast against their will, in either case it would have been perfectly natural that they should have established themselves in that region. Traits of Egyptian manners have been found among many of the nations of South America, <clears throat> mingled with those who appear to be of other origin, of which we shall speak again in the course of this work. And then I'll go on and show you this uh, stuff that's supposedly uh, writing of these uh, people. Okay, now I'm going to talk about a uh, well that was dug, what was found. This is page 125. Cincinnati is situated on one of these examples of antiquity of great extent. They are found on the upper level of that town, but none on the lower one. They are so conspicuous as to catch the first range of the eye. A gentleman who was living near the town of Cincinnati in 1826 on the upper level had occasion to sink a well for his accommodation, who persevered in digging to the depth of 80 feet, uh, finding not water, but still persisting at, in the attempt he found himself finally uh, obstructed by a substance, not stone. We cleaned the surface and then found a, what appeared to be a stump of a tree, three feet in diameter, two feet high, cut down with an axe. The blows of the axe were yet visible. Ten feet below this the water sprang up, and the well is now constant and high rate. That means that the tree is undoubtedly antediluvian. The river, now called the Ohio, did not exist anterior to the deluge, inasmuch as the remains of the tree were found firm, firmly rooted in its original position several feet below the bed of the river. An American people before the flood has appeared from the action of the axe in cutting down the tree. And that America was peopled. And fourth, that the antediluvian Americans were ant acquainted with the use and properties of iron as the rust of the axe was on the top of the stump when discovered. And then, this is going to overlap with Champollion. And then we get to page 132 and 133 talking about Noah and Eden. So here's some stuff for uh, Eden and Noah and Adam and but as we have argued in the commencement of this volume, that Shem was Melchizedek, and that from him a knowledge of the exact situation of Eden might have been obtained by the First Nations after the Flood, it may be inquired how could he tell them if he was born in America so far from the location of Eden. To this we reply that it should not be supposed that the antediluvians were without the means of recording facts, even by the use of letters or their equivalents, which are pictures, nor that they had no knowledge of the geography of the globe as it was before the flood and the means of communication with each other, however distant their colonies may have been. It is not to be supposed that more than 1,600 years could pass away without the antediluvians having enjoyed the advantages of art and science, seeing, seeing these are the natural results of human society, the ark itself a demonstration that even shipbuilding was known, or how could Noah have undertook what was meant when it was said to him, build an ark of gopher wood. All right, page 241. The discovery of these ruins and also many others equally wonderful in the same country are just commencing to arouse the attention of the schools of Europe, which hitherto have denied that America could boast of her antiquities, but these immense ruins are now being explored under the direction of scientific persons, a history of which in detail will be forthcoming doubtless in due time. Uh, by those deeply versed in the antiquities of past ages, it is contended that the first people who settled in America came directly from Chaldea. 
immediately after the confusion of language at Babel. Uh, Whoever the authors of the city may have been, we seem to find in their sculptured deities the idolatry of even the Phoenicians, a people whose history goes back nearly to the flood or within a few, within 150 years of that period. It appears uh, from the historical works of the Mexicans written in pictures which fell into the hands of Spaniards that there was found uh, written by Votan and sets himself up to be the third Gentile Reckoning from the flood, the Lord of uh, the Sacred Drum, and so on. Okay, so now I'm going to read from the Nauvoo Endowment Company's 1845-46 documentary history by Davery Anderson, Gary Bergara, and forwarded by Richard Van Wagener. Sorry, Mormon, right? Page 100, December 20th, 1845, President Brigham Young, having slept in the temple last night, was early at his post dictating in relation to the business of the day and arranging the workmen in order, after which he listened to a reading from Captain Fremont's journal by Franklin D. Richards uh, in the East Room, where present at the same time were Parley Pratt, uh, George A. Smith, uh, Phelps, Jedediah Grant, George Millers, you know, Rich, uh, Daniel Cairn, Hosea Stout, John Brown, this list all these people that are present, all right. 113. Uh, Brigham Young, I, Brigham Young, dictated the arrangements for the day. Afterwards, with a few of the twelve apostles and others, heard Franklin D. Richards read Fremont's journal, giving his accounts of his travel to California. Page 219. Several high priests, not members of the high council, met with so-and-so. The names of those present follow uh, f as follows. Now, now if I own a copy of Fremont from 1844, don't you think the Mormons would have one? Because I got one. It's a real copy right here. Whole thing. Not a copy, it's the real book. All the meteorological, the maps, a couple maps. See, here's a map right here. <laughs> 1844. Okay, if I've got it, you can bet they've got it. Let me delicately put this down, because <coughs> I didn't mean to do that. Here's Gunnison, 1853. This description, it's not like that at all, it's just a, a book. It would be like Fremont talking about his experience. Here's Stansbury. This is like Fremont. This is a Stansbury. This is a 1849, just a few years later. Now, Fremont was the big book. He's the one that broke the ground officially. But uh, here's Stansbury. So the Mormons had access. Of course, I know they were already in Utah by 1850. That's sort of the point, isn't it? Um, these books were available then and they're available now. So you can bet they were studying this. And my point again is that if they're studying this, why aren't they studying their Egyptian? You need to study your Egyptian so you don't put your foot up your ass. Uh, 